In this video, we are going to talk about Einstein's PhD dissertation, which he wrote in 1905. It's called A New Determination of Molecular Dimensions. We are going to do the necessary calculations to find the results and the correct calculations because Einstein made some mistakes in the calculations for his PhD dissertation. Before Einstein's PhD dissertation, the earliest determination of real sizes of molecules were made possible by the kinetic theory of gases, whereas the physical phenomena observed in liquids had not served up to that point for the determination of molecular sizes. Einstein shows in this paper, in his dissertation, that the sizes of molecules of substances dissolved in a solution can be obtained from the internal friction of the solution and the solvent and from the diffusion of the dissolved substance within the solvent. The volume of the molecule of the dissolved substance will be thought of as being large with respect to the volume of the molecule of the solvent. Such a molecule will behave approximately as a solid body suspended in a solvent and it will be permissible to apply to the motion of the solvent in the neighborhood of a molecule the hydrodynamic equations, namely Navier-Stokes equations. Consider an incompressible homogeneous liquid with a coefficient of viscosity that we will call k. Usually in books you will find mu, but we will use k, just like Einstein did, whose velocity, so the velocity of this uh, liquid, the velocity components of this liquid are u, v, and w, so we have the velocity along x, the velocity along y, and the velocity along z. We have three components. These velocities, these components of the velocity, are functions of the coordinates x, y, z, and also time, so they will depend on x, y, z, and possibly also on time. At an arbitrary point, let's say x0, y0, z0, the functions u, v, w can be developed as functions of x minus x0, y minus y0, and z minus z0 according to the Taylor expansion, Taylor series, right? The motion of the liquid contained in a small region, let's call it capital G, just like Einstein did. This region contains the point x0, y0, z0, and the motion of the liquid can be thought, can be thought of as a superposition of three motions. One, so the first motion is parallel displacement. Let me write it here, parallel displacement of all liquid particles without the change in their relative positions. And then to a rotation of the liquid without a change in the relative position of the liquid particles. So we also have a rotation. And three, this is the most important, a dilatational motion. Let me write it here, dilatational motion in three mutually perpendicular directions. So the three axes are called the axes of dilatation. Let us now assume that in the region G, which contains the point x0, y0, z0, there is a spherical rigid body whose center shall lie at the point x0, y0, z0 here, and whose dimensions shall be very small compared with those of the region G. We further assume, just like Einstein considered, that the motion under consideration is so slow that the kinetic energy of the sphere and also that of the liquid can be neglected. So we will neglect the effects due to inertia. Besides, so let me also say that this will simplify the hydrodynamic equations or Navier-Stokes equations. 
Besides, we assume that the velocity components of a surface element of the sphere coincide with the corresponding velocity components of the adjacent liquid particles. This means that the coefficient of viscosity is non-negligible. That's what we mean by that. It is clear that the sphere takes part in the partial motions that I have numbered here. So one and two in this case. So the sphere takes part in the partial motions one and two, parallel displacement and rotation without modifying the motion of the neighboring particles, since the liquid moves like a rigid body in these partial motions. And since we neglected the effects of inertia, remember that the kinetic energy is negligible. That's what we assume. However, as regards motion three, dilatational motion, this motion gets modified by the presence of the sphere. And Einstein's task was to investigate the effect of the sphere on this motion of the liquid. If we refer motion three to a coordinate system whose uh, axes are parallel to the principal axis of dilatation, we can describe the motion in the region G. If the sphere is not present by the following equations. So we have U, let's say, let's call it U zero because we are not considering the sphere. So U zero, the velocity along the X axis of dilatation is some constant A times X minus X zero. Remember that we have Consider the Taylor expansion inside this region, which is quite small, but the sphere is even smaller than this region. And this is equal to A xi, where xi is simply this difference x minus x0. This is Einstein's definition. Then we have V0 is simply equal to another constant B times y minus y0 and this is called era, so this is equal to B times era. And then we have the Z component without the presence of the sphere, which is W0. And this is equal to C times Z minus Z0. And this is defined as zeta. So C times zeta, just like this. Now, A, B, and C are constants which due to the incompressibility of the liquid, satisfy the following condition. It's A plus B plus C equal to zero. And this is simply due to the fact that the divergence of the velocity vector is equal to zero for an incompressible fluid. We have already seen this in a previous video when, where I derived the um, nadis stokes equations. If now we consider the presence of the sphere and we call its radius capital R, so we consider now the sphere and we call its radius capital R, the motion of the liquid around it will change. Due to the symmetry of the motion of the liquid, it is clear that the sphere cannot perform either a rotation or a translation during the motion considered. And we obtain therefore the boundary conditions which are u equal to v equal to w equal to zero for rho equal to the square root of xi squared plus era squared plus zeta squared equal to r. Here, u, v, and w denote the velocity components of the motion now considered. So the motion that is modified by the sphere, we can put u equal to a xi, which is the first part of the motion where the sphere is not considered, plus u1, which is some contribution due to the presence of the sphere. And then we have v equal to b era plus v1, w equal to c zeta plus w1. The velocity u1, v1, W1, so the three components of the velocity, have to vanish at the boundary of our region G. And since the region G is considered to be much larger than the sphere, 
it means that u1, v1, w1 have to vanish at infinity. Now, u, v and w must satisfy the Navier-Stokes equations. If we write them in the same form as in a previous video, so you can check the video, the two videos, because I derived them in uh, two previous videos, part one and part two. If you check them in my course, in one of my courses on partial differential equations, the two videos are essentially correct. Uh, there is no problem at all. Whereas on YouTube, for example, the second video has some formulas which have to be corrected and you have to check the first comment that I have put in the comment section because there is a link to the video without these small mistakes. We are talking about small mistakes. I had just added some parentheses in some of the formulas, but the final formulas are correct. You just have to be careful and remember doing this if you check the videos on YouTube because this video here will be published in one of my courses and also on my YouTube channel. But in my courses, there are more, de more details than, of course, on YouTube. And also the videos are arranged in a, a, an interesting order, meaning that it will be more helpful as it will guide you from one concept to the other. Whereas on YouTube, you, just, you will just find some random content without a particular order. Sometimes I have created some playlists but this is not, it is not the case for, for, uh, for this. So that's uh, just something that I wanted to tell you. Anyway, let's write down Navier-Stokes equations and we write them in the same form as in the previous video. So we will write them as rho times F, which is a vector representing forces per unit, per unit mass. Whereas rho is the density of the fluid which is incompressible, so it will be a constant, minus the gradient of pressure. And then we have plus, we have a constant given by mu prime plus mu, which are related to the viscosity. And this mu here is what Einstein calls K. And then we, here we have the gradient of the divergence of the velocity. And since the fluid is incompressible, this will be zero. So this part we cancel. Then we have plus mu, which remember is equal to k, del squared v, the Laplacian of the velocity. And then on the right hand side, we have the density times the material derivative of the velocity, which is very similar to a total derivative. And it can be written like this it is partial derivative of the velocity with respect to time plus velocity dot product gradient of the velocity. So it can be written like this. So as you can see, here we have a gradient of a vector, which is a tensor. It's like a matrix here. And this part is negligible because we have assumed that forces due to inertia are negligible. So this is related to inertia. And we assume that this part is negligible. So Einstein will only consider this part of the formula, this part, the gradient of the pressure, and he also assumes that there are no forces per unit mass. So this will be zero as well. And therefore, what we are left with is this. We are left with the gradient of pressure equal to k del squared v. And we are going to start from here in the next lecture to carry out the calculations because we have to start from this equation, which represents Navier-Stokes Navier equation. And there are three components because this is a vector equation. As you will see, the calculations are quite long. It will take us some time to reach the most important results of this paper. But I think that they are very important because they will show you how Einstein reasoned regarding these Navier-Stokes equations. And then 
there will be very useful concepts that will arise later on. So I suggest that you check the following parts.